but I wanted to pray for our friend Daryl, introduce him, and then we'll we'll go ahead and get started. So, Daryl is a good friend, a uh, brother in Christ, a member of Hope Point, an attorney. Uh, it's taught me plenty of things, both in the practice of law and and in faith, and so that's why he's here, because he's got wisdom to offer. Um, I think that Daryl is an incredibly um, gifted reader of texts, and especially this one. How many times have you read Screwtape? At least 20 times. At least 20 times. So if there's ever an expert <laughs> at a hope point on Screwtape, I think it's Daryl. So um, I'm, I'm really excited to hear uh, what you have to offer today and the ways in which Screwtape helps us in Lent. Um, and then on the 26th of March, Sarah Bradley will be, raise your hand, Sarah. Don't be shy. Sarah will be leading us through the great divorce. So put that on your calendar as well. Um, let's pray, Daryl. Almighty God, I give you thanks for my brother, for the way in which you have gifted him. I pray that you would protect him now, Lord, from all those forces that would take his mind away from the topic at hand. Clear away all the distractions, Lord. Sharpen his thoughts and his words for us, that we might hear your truth through him and through your servant, C.S. Lewis. So we offer up this time to you, Lord. Be present amongst us by your spirit. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I see faces that I know and that know me, and I see some that I uh, don't know and don't know me, and then a smattering in between. And I see some folks here tonight from Providence Classical School, where our children go to school. Uh, thank you all for being here, and, and uh, my presentation tonight on screw tip Letters will take a different approach uh, than Daniel Krosniak did. Daniel's a very gifted teacher. I can say that from the very close vicarious experience with my own children. I, I don't have a natural gifting. I don't think I'm worse than average uh, teaching, but I think I'm about average. And so there will be times tonight where I realize, oh, I'm running behind schedule. And when that happens, I may just pivot suddenly and y'all may go, whoa, well, what just happened? But I wanna keep our time covenant uh, for all of you out of, out of uh, respect and, and affection for your families as well. Um, some of you who know me in here realize that I'm actually a deeply emotional person. Many of you don't know that about me. I'm an oil and gas transactional lawyer. You can all wake up now. It's not really, it's about that exciting and stuff. But I, but I love the theater. It's something Father Michael and I share in common. I love theater uh, a great deal. And uh, I think it's a way of expressing things. But tonight we're going to talk about uh, screw tape letters, of course, real quick. Um, before I do a, not a prayer, but an invocation, uh, raise your hand real quick if you've read the book and read it in the last five years. Okay, so screw tape, I'll let you know if you haven't or if you want to refresh, which you're going to be encouraged to do tonight, I encourage you to do it in au uh, audio book of some kind of format. It's one of the few books where I can actually get as much out of it uh, that way. And we're going to listen to some very short um, clips tonight of my favorite reading of screw tape uh, letters. Um, but I'm going to begin with what Lewis put in the beginning uh, of his book, one of the two quotes from Martin Luther. He said, the best way to drive out the devil if he will not yield to texts of scripture is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. So that's what I'm going to be hoping to lead us to towards the end of tonight, which is how do we flout and jeer Lucifer? I'm going to try to remember to keep using a name for him because I think he has a name. Our Savior has a name. My Savior's name is Jesus. I think everybody in here knows their Savior's name. The counterpart is Lucifer. That he has a name, and he knows our names. He knows our names. And Lucifer's not in this room tonight. I'm very confident. I've been in this room hundreds and hundreds of times. Lucifer's never once been here. I've seen 
loose for one other time in my life. I won't talk about that tonight unless y'all want to ask afterwards, somebody else like out in the atrium or something. But he's not here tonight. I've never sensed him here, and I've always felt real safe here, and y'all will be too, so I want to use that safe place to talk about Lucifer, because that's what this book is about. So let me give you some of the history and context of, about the book. Um, it was written in 1941, really during the Battle of Britain, uh, where the British people were being bombed and mercilessly, the civilians were, by Nazi Germany trying to annihilate them. And so Lewis uh, did some of his best work in this time period. I'm, I'm not a Lewis scholar. I love C.S. Lewis, but I'm no Lewis scholar. I haven't made an exhaustive study. I have read the book, uh, but that is for reasons y'all understand, because it struck me to my core. It terrified me the first time I read it, which was 2010, uh, here after I had thought I had come to Christ at Hope Point, when instead I just kind of turned a little bit towards him. So this is, uh, there are 31 letters uh, in all that were written by a character named Screwtape uh, to a character, and Screwtape's the only one we hear from in the book. It's the only one I ever hear from. They're just penned letters to Wormwood, his nephew and young apprentice, who's a tempter. They're both tempters. Wormwood is a tempter in the service of Lucifer. And, and Screwtape's a tempter, and he's, Screwtape's his mentor. Wormwood, by the way, is uh, mentioned in Revelations. I, don't, I hope you all can see that. I didn't know how big to make the font. But um, in, in Revelation, the third star to fall upon the earth was wormwood, and it brought bitterness to a third of all the waters on the earth, and many men died from the bitter water. Lewis wrote all 31 letters in six months. He deeply disliked the entire experience. When you look in the beginning of the print version, he dedicates it to his very, very dear friend, J.R.R. Tolkien, who cringed at that, who found it really disturbing and troubling. He's just like, oh, I wish you had not dedicated that to me. And the, the dramatis personae, I hope I said that right for you Latinants uh, in the room, is there these characters, Screwtape, Wormwood, and the patient. The patient's a man, he's a British man. Uh, I think he's probably in his 20s, given the context of the book. None of that's really relevant. He's just a human being. It doesn't matter where he was or any, any, that, he, that he was a man and not a woman. Um, the book, as you go through it, and as we go through it tonight, I have to give you the orientation that it's upside down. And so in this book, the enemy is God. That's our, our God, the God of the Bible, Jesus. That's the enemy in here. And our father below is Lucifer. So this is Wormwood coaching how to take a man's soul and damn it to hell for eternity for a particular purpose. And that purpose is for Lucifer's purpose. And so the book is a satanic play, if, if you will. It's been, it's been turned into various plays. Um, but it's a play, it's a roadmap of how Satan tempts the people in this room not the people in Huntsville on death row an hour away from here. The book's not about that. The book's about me. And it's about Dwight and Mark and about Judy. It's about Katie Dearman. Okay? That's who it's about. And the whole book is about how we can end up in hell. So that's heavy. And if any of y'all watched my little video entry, you said I, it's heavy. It is heavy. It's not, it's not pleasant. So why in Lent? why uh, I'm doing this because Father Michael asked me to do it in Lent. Um, so, but it's a time when we're paying a lot more attention to God's will for us, his plan and his blueprint. It's that season of the year when we're doing that. We're really intensely focused. For me, much more so than Christmas. Um, it's prime time though to get tempted to get tempted to sin and to get tempted by Satan with our own, you're gonna to hear tonight, your own personal tempter. Some of us, some people in this room believe, I've got my own personal angel of the Lord there to help me and protect me. 
And, and I don't know that. Sometimes I feel like I do, other times I don't. I, I, I don't have a strong opinion about that. I know for sure I have tempters. I know that absolutely. They're from hell, and they burn with Satan, and they want me there with them. So it's a prime time to get tempted, um, but there is armor that we can wear. We're told in the Bible there's armor. We can put it on, and it's, in this case, it's using an emotion called fear. The book should frighten you when you read it if you allow yourself, as we're going to talk about in a minute, to get emotionally open while you're reading it and not shuck off the fear. But there's knowledge. It's going to, work. It's going to use that emotion called fear to encourage you to use your brains and your will to turn back to God and beat that fear. Um, if you haven't ever read it, it'll take you about four hours to get through it. It's a really fast. That's an, uh, like uh, Audible reads about four hours of time, maybe five. Um, and if, if you read it, I suspect, knowing the many of you in here that I do, you'll see yourself everywhere in the book. I did. I saw myself everywhere. I was reading it. Go, oh, my God, that's me. That's exactly what I'm doing. And it was written 80 years ago by a man you never met. You never met him, and he wrote me. I never met the man. He wrote me perfectly. He knew exactly what was going on, what was going to happen. And so that rattled me. It disturbed me because I already thought, man, I'm reformed now. I don't, I'm not, I don't need this. I found Jesus. So if you do find yourself getting rattled, you should ask yourself, why is this rattling me? So there are some assumptions I'm going to be working from tonight. Um, I'm not seeking to establish these in your mind tonight that I'm right or anything. I just need you to go with me. It's, you know, I come from a field, you know, from a land of engineers. I'm not one myself. But engineers make assumptions from which they work. We're going to make some tonight. One of these, the first one, is directly an assumption that I've adopted from Lewis in a different work. We are not bodies with souls. This, isn't, this is not what I am. I am a soul, and I have a body, and so does each and every one of you here. Why does this matter? Well, as we're going to talk about it just in the, in the next couple of slides, it matters because our tempters and our angels, but tonight our tempters, they're spirits. They have no flesh. They're pure spirits. But if we're souls, we will live forever, and we're going to live forever if we believe in what the Bible tells us, I will live forever, and I will live forever in one of two places. And I, I kind of get to choose, which it is. So all of us in this room, my second assumption, everybody in here has sinned. We sin today, and we're gonna sin again tomorrow. Some of those are small sins. I can, I can look around right now, I can see my wife. Like, I don't, she'll sin one day, I'll know what it is. I haven't seen it yet, but she will. Some are big, some are big sins, some of us have committed some big sins, and some are spectacular sins. And there's at least two, three people in this room who know some of my, uh, uh, frankly know all of my, my own spectacular sins, all of them. And there's a wake-up call in this book, but there's really good news, because this book helps us bridge to this book, which is what gets us what we need to get away from the fear and to bring that, to answer that wake-up call with the right response. And one of those that's really important, because we're, we're going to launch now into kind of some scary things, um, is that we are good enough, like we all think of a good little boy, like, like Joey Dearman. Joey Dearman's a really good little boy, okay? And, and so... He's a good, like, I'm a, I'm a good boy, I'm a good little boy. Sometimes I feel like I am a good little boy, other times not, but we're good enough because we have Jesus. However, that assumption, that last part, that's a, that's a foundation assumption. If Satan exists, if Lucifer actually exists, if you believe that part of the Bible, you must believe he wants your soul with him in eternity. Don't just contemplate what I refer to as the Euro Jesus, the blonde, blue-eyed Jesus with a lamb in his arms, 
And maybe he's got a staff to protect us all, and that's a very good image of Jesus. But there's a different image, too, of Lucifer, and he's not carrying a lamb, okay? So keep that in mind. Okay, so our goals for tonight, I want to convince you to read or reread the book as applicable and to do that the next time you do it with emotional exposure. Don't just read it intellectually. It's not a Lewis book to mark off, get in the right frame of mind. You really don't have to read them in order. You can pick it up and start reading almost anywhere. It helps to read the, the third, third of the book last, but you don't have to. Um, we're just going to dwell on a couple of the letters tonight. That's all we got time for. Um, but the book is going to evoke or provoke this really powerful emotion. But it's going to use that emotion, I hope, tonight will give you the framework for disciplined contemplation, a methodical contemplation of yourself and your life as Christians into actions. It is a call to do something, not just think about things. The, the part, hopefully tonight we'll have some nervous laughter. Maybe you'll have some on your own as you see yourself in the book like I have going, oh boy, that's kind of funny. Um, and then it's going to suggest actions to fight your way to actual laughter, to jeer and flout Lucifer because he cannot stand that. Um, and so I want to talk though about and give you some tools to use your will, the human intellectual will, to course correct and course correct our spiritual posture towards courage, worship, and ultimately through those first two things, obedience to God. So where and how does the devil work? Now, I'm going to start with a really good source, the Bible, that tells us that. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, you, Lewis uses this particular metaphor often throughout the book. This is, uh, this is Peter. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a lion seeking someone to devour. And I think that's literal. In that, I, 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 t I take it very literally, and I find it very useful to keep it literal. That means when we walk out of here tonight, as we're going home, Satan and his minions are prowling, looking to devour me like a lion. So, but what does Lewis say about how the devil accomplishes this work? Well, for starters, his presence is concealed from our eyes. And I'm going to try something that for a 56-year-old is a big step with technology. I'm going to try to play a clip for you off my phone and have it come out on that box. And I want you to listen. So this is John Cleese. For those of you who are old, you might recognize him as one of the founders of the troupe called Monty Python. And I was shocked. I'm like, John Cleese reading screw tape letters? But uh, uh, oh, okay. To us, yeah. a human is primarily food. Sorry, I thought it uh, should be To us, a human is primarily food. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at its expense. To us. So that's John Cleese, and, and that in my head is the voice I always heard as screw tape reading. It doesn't have to be yours. Some of you, you might hear a woman's voice whenever you're saying, or a man's, or a different man, there are a number of different readers. But I wanted you to hear that line. That's what it sounds like to hear it. To us, humans are primarily food. Okay? Later on, we'll listen and hear what God thinks of us as is beings who are servants that he wants to make into brothers of his that he can fill up. He is full. So, but I wanted you to hear that and, and, and think about that and process what was just said because I think it's true. We are food to Satan. So one of the ways I think Satan works, and Lewis is talking about this in the book, is he conceals himself and his minions, his tempters, from our eyes. So one of the things I think that's powerful in our lives is imagery. 
Um, so can y'all, is that too red? I can't tell. Is that legible and, or, or on your handouts? Consider whether or not you believe the spirit world is real life. And so, and ask as you're balancing that out, do you concur with Lewis's first assumption that we're souls who have a body? And if we are, then I would suggest to you that real life is less this and your car drive home and my employment, what I do for money and all those things. And it's all the things that are in here. This is actually real life and all those physical things that we get caught up with might not be as real life. So in, in the book though, one of the quotes is, teach him, this is, this is screw tape, telling Wormwood how to coach the patient into the right frame of mind so we can separate him from, from the enemy. Teach him to call it real life and don't let him ask what it, he means by real. Don't just keep him distracted, and that's going to be one of the big themes that you're going to re- hear about in the book. Don't, you don't have to do a lot to him. Just keep him distracted. Don't let him ask what real life is. So this is, uh, we'll leave, I'll show you what I hope is the next slide. Yeah, so when you think of Satan, some of us, uh, again, when I'm old, so I say, well, that's kind of an image of Satan. There's lots of them similar. Uh, to that, but this is Lewis in letter seven. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you, Wormwood. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, because that's nonsense, I've seen him, that's not what he looks like. Uh, It's an old textbook method of confusing them. He therefore cannot believe in you, in that spirit, in that temper. He can't, he can't believe in you because he can't, he can't. I mean, this is the image that's conjured thanks to Lu- Lucifer's successful inroads in modernity. This is where he's cast himself as a buffoon, as a cartoon character when he's not that at all. So he talks then about, in, in the first letter, as he's opening these letters, he says, oh, and whatever you do, don't let him get away from that invaluable real life. Let him keep focusing on the day, on what he comes to call the stream. And that stream is just your sensory world that you feel and are aware of. My, I, I, have a, I have bursitis in my knee right now a little bit. I kind of am aware of it. It hurts a little bit. I'm, I obsess over that or I'm a spot on my arm or I'll think about what I've got to do tomorrow for work. Most of my day, I won't think about what, what did I do today for God's glory? Did I talk to one other person outside of Hope Point in some evangelism moment? Or did I pray for somebody else? What did I do? No, I'm thought a lot about had what I had to do tonight, and then I thought about, well, I better get my week organized uh, for the real world. But one of the things that Lewis does, I think, magnificently in the first letter is to demonstrate how Satan doesn't want us to use our reason, our logic, our wills, because then, he, as he says, we're, they, the tempters, are moving on to the enemy's grounds when we begin to use our minds paired with our hearts. God gave us both. He gave us our emotions. I have, I'm, in, I'm entitled to have emotions. I'm entitled to feel fear and anger in the right context because God gave me those emotions and love and joy and happiness and laughter. I'm entitled to all of that, but I have reason as well. And he cautions in letter one, if you use reason with the patient about, for instance, an atheist sitting in a library reading books who thinks, huh, I wonder if any of that could be real, if any of that claptrap in the Bible, don't try to persuade that person with reason because you will find that you have been strengthening in your patient 
the fatal habit, it's fatal to them. That everything in the book is upside down. The fatal habit of attending to universal issues and withdrawing his attention from the stream of immediate sense experiences. Your business is to fix his attention on the stream. So our mission, those of us in this room, is to do exactly the opposite of what Satan's tempters want us to do. What Lucifer wants us to do, we just do the opposite. Do not focus on the stream. And this book is a really good way to shake you up um, about in that way and to find the courage to do that. So now we're going to move on to the second way that I'm going to be mindful of time. Okay. Um, the, the second way, the second tool Satan, it, it's, it's really a result that he uses the nothing. Or why all sins are useful to the devil. So there's a couple of, uh, there's one, uh, one of the most famous quotes out of the book is murdering cards. It's, it's what I call it. Um, and I, I'm going to play it, I'm going to play it for you just uh, an abbreviated snip. And later on, we'll come back in a little bit more. But listen, to, I want you to listen to the tone of the voice. anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. I heard some gasps. That's good. That's good. That's, that's murder is no better than cards. If cards will do the trick, what's the trick? It's not that you know, all of us have co committed all these smaller sins. I did today. I confessed my sins in writing to Father Michael Dearman, my confessor, before I came up here tonight. And I asked Father Michael to help me enter into a state of repentance for my sins because I didn't want to be up here in this state of sin because I sinned a bunch this week. We're not going to get past that. We're not going to stop sinning. That's not what the book is a call to do. So there's another uh, part of it that's sort of the subset of the nothing, and that is the, what I call the road to perdition. Yes, it was a movie, but I was using that term before the movie released. Um, so there, there's healthy and outgoing activities that God wants us to have and engage in so so that we can be healthy and happy and it's things like sleep and good and a, and a, a, re, a regular amount of exercise and good food and and things like that. it's not all just reading the bible and reading scripture and being gloomy we're not a gloomy lot we're not this isn't about all being heavy and all that but we have healthy activities but the nothing is the distraction for the few of you here and young and use a lot of social media is the distraction of social media. That's the stream. Um, it can be anything. Television in our generation, my wife and I's generation, you when you were little, TV, anything. Anything is a good substitute for what God would be having us do because it's all nothingness. It's all vanity, to quote Ecclesiastes. It's vanity, it's nothingness, and that's what he uses. So this is, out of screw tape in letter 12, the enemy is described as one without whom nothing is strong. And it's very strong. He says, you will find soon, he's talking to Wormwood, pretty soon if you use nothing, you'll find that anything or nothing is sufficient to attract his wandering attention. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods of time and whiling away his best years, not with no good memories, just sort of gray mush. And one of the most frightening things in the book is when he says, and this is one of the things that really struck me, he says that it's so enjoyable as a tempter to take from the patient 
everything that's good and give him nothing in return, it will make you feel so fulfilled when you do that, Wormwood. And that was me. I was chasing nothing. I was chasing a bunch of vanities. And some of you are too. And I beseech you, use the book as the wake-up call. Don't do that anymore. Don't chase nothing. This is Lent. I'm going to make sure, so on time, that we have enough at the end to talk about what is there in place of nothing that is special to Lent. Jesus died so that we could have a substitute for nothingness. So I call making him do nothing at all the road to perdition. It's a very old word, and I'm, I'm going to presume most of you all know what perdition is, but just in case, for those of you who don't, it's a road to destruction and isolation, and it's a road, it, biblically, to damnation. That's what it means. Here is the road to damnation, the road to perdition. So what are they? They're small sins. What's the road to perdition? It's sins. The road to hell is paved with really good intentions and small sins. So, let me see if I can make the magic work again. Indeed. The safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones. Yep. It's the safest road to hell, isn't it? When I, was, when I have sinned spe- spectacularly in my life, that's not, I'm not being self-effacing or, or, or particularly humble. I'm just telling you, I've done, especially before I met my wife, I did a lot of, I, I had a wild youth. Beyond that, I had a lot of other my workplace kinds of things. But then, when I was doing the worst things I've ever done in my life, I knew, I knew I was doing wrong. I chose to keep doing it, but I know I'm like, oh man, he's gonna get me one day. But that day wasn't today, so I'm gonna keep doing those things. And so, I, but that's how they, how it happens. And in letter 12, that's what the entire letter is about is the road to perdition. There, he says, you will say that these are very small sins and doubtless, like all young tempters, you're, you're anxious to report spectacular wickedness. The only thing that matters is that you separate the man from the enemy with small sins. So, so some in the room, some people in the room, not everybody, especially in, in this day and age, but historically it's been men who are tempted by pornography, consuming pornography. Okay, that's a big temptation. It's like, well, I'm not really cheating on my wife when I do that. I'm not actually cheating. Well, yeah, you are. We're going to talk about, I don't have to talk about why you are. I'm just going to relate why, why, why we are and when it happens. But it doesn't matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to move the man away from the light and out into the nothing. That's what Satan is. He's nothing. And that's where he says, murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Don't try to make us, there's nobody in this room who, I'm gonna hopefully skip correctly. So I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to to something I hope will be a little more effective here. Nobody in this room is at risk right now of committing carnage. Not gonna, nobody in this room is going to go out and drive through a parade full of, of, of senior citizens dancing on the 4th of July for everybody's enjoyment. It's, we're not going to do that. Nobody in this room is doing that. Nor, though, are we saved from damnation because we manage to avoid those spectacular sins. Hell isn't just for Adolf Hitler. It's not just for Benito Mussolini. It's not just for Ted Bundy. And, and uh, if, Man, if those were the only people in hell, there wouldn't be hardly anybody there. So I'm gonna encourage you to make small inroads, little bits at a time. My wife calls it the tortoise approach to things. Um, but to do that, I wanna pause and consider, hey, I'm not King David or Bathsheba. Okay, that's the beginning of Psalm 51, right? We're all, that's Ash Wednesday. 
most of my sins are super small, right? I didn't commit adultery and then have that woman's husband murdered to cover up my sexual sin. I didn't do that, so I'm really not that bad a guy. And right? that hells for people like that, of course. David was the beloved king, a fallen man, God's chosen king. So what might screw tape be thinking about those small sins, those little bitty sins? And so the book talks about this quite a bit. And that's those small sins are what are edging us out into the nothing. He doesn't have to convince us to reject our faith in God. He just has to constantly turn us away to nothingness, to fall into that. And I'm saying that as though that's me saying this. It's, it's Lewis in the book. And that's why I said I want to use that to encourage you uh, to read it uh, by, by the time Easter comes here. So uh, 12 minutes remaining, we're going to talk about what actions to take. How do we resist these tempters? How do we avoid sinning? Stay away from this. These, they want us to sin. So should we always remember to don't think about white elephants? Everybody in the room just thought about white elephant. I've run the experiment before. I was given the experiment by a psychology professor. You all thought about white elephants. And as long as I say that word, you'll always think about white elephants. So first, what can we do? Step one, we must heed Peter the Apostle's warning to us. He meant to scare us that Satan roams the earth like a lion looking for the next soul to devour. We have the emotion as human beings called fear for a reason. It's a survival instinct. If you're going to be in a car crash, you have a whole bunch of physiological reactions. You have fear. You understand what it is. Some people scream, break into a sweat. Your heart rate picks up. You have an emotion called fear, though, to warn you when you're, when you're reading something and it's hitting close to home. Don't turn away from that. Keep reading it, if it's making you fear, there's something in you that needs to be addressed in that. Please do that. And this book made me feel fear. It still does. So what else can we do? We can take actions. We can worship daily, constantly, not at set times. Spring into worship. When you start realizing, when you wake up and you realize, wait, I'm being tempted. I'm thinking I'm thinking really bad thoughts about my brother. I'm saying things with an unrestrained tongue that I don't want to say right now. If I keep thinking about that, I'll keep doing it. I'll keep thinking of seeing the white elephant. So I encourage you, as, as, what, what can we do? We can replace the fear and the sin with worship and praise. The... the story of the evil spirit that's driven out from the man, I think, uh, Father Michael, I'm going to look at you to nod. It's in Matthew the, that roams the earth. So in Matthew that roams the earth, he go, he's driven out, and the man gets his house swept and put in order, and he feels really good because the evil spirit was driven out. And um, as somebody who's had an evil spirit in him, it's, and it's not like Y'all, it's not like the exorcist or anything. Somebody who's lived with an evil spirit, having it driven out feels amazing when it's over. It's very painful getting it out, but it's, but it's incredible when it's over. But now my house is swept and put in order, and the spirit goes out, it roams the earth, and it's hungry and thirsty, it's parched, it finds no rest, so it goes back to the man's house, and he looks in the window and says, hey, it's, it's swept and put in order. But wait, he's, he already kicked me out once. What should I do? I'll go get seven of my friends and we'll come back and we will beat his A really badly and that's what he does. So instead, don't try. This is, this is Daryl. This is my little hopefully added value here. Don't focus on the sin. Whatever the sin is, if it's my eye looking lustfully at a woman, having lust in my heart, which is adultery, according to Jesus, and then don't keep focusing on that woman. Stop, stop staring at her because I'm just going to stare more. Don't have those thoughts. Don't, don't think about my money. I love money. I'm very greedy. I love money. Don't keep thinking about it 
And that's part of this because Satan from Screwtape wants us to focus on the stream of emotions and stimulations and wants us to focus on anything except the consequences of going out into the nothing. So I viewed this book after probably the seventh or eighth time I read it. And now I'll give you the context. I came to Christ here in this church, right over there, sitting right over there. It was my turn. That was my inflection point. It was mountaintop experience and all that. Um, and, but, but I thought, man, whew, I'm saved. I'm good. And, and I was clicking along and I had new friends, started coming to Bible study and helping people move their household possessions around. And boy, I felt great. Robert Shaw was there with me. Bruce Lacombe was there with me others um, but I realized when I somebody challenged me to read the book I was like hey why don't you read this book there's a letter in there where exactly that thing happens this man converts and it's changed he feels great and he's excited he's got new friends and some new habits and he didn't really change. His state of spirit was exactly the same and that was me so I went on I had some other stumbles a bunch of falls but through all of that, what I can share with you, after you read the book and you understand how important it is, because I don't, for those of you who don't already do this as a discipline, I don't know that you will be able to do it. I couldn't. I'm just sure. I'm, I think I'm like all of you. I, could, I wasn't successful at first. Dwelling in your own thoughts about your own sin in the moment and in retrospect is counterproductive. And you're going to read in here how that's one of the tools Satan uses to get you to think endlessly about your own sins but not about the consequences of them so I encourage you tonight that's one of those encouragements to take away to replace the fear with is you can think about the consequences of your sin in the moment because that's the opposite so the book how do we get to Christianity and salvation is to do the opposite of what Satan wants us to do to burn with him in hell, to eat us as his food. So, some verbs. Verbs are action words. Repent, that is an infinitive, meaning to change. So it's a verb, that's an action word. It means do something now. Repent, what do we do? Praise, worship. So, we can make the disciplines of small change, worship, some scripture reading. I, sometimes I'll yell out, Jesus, and not like I always have in, in, in exclamation, but, but try to sin while you're saying, Jesus, 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 just quietly, God. Holy Spirit. It gets much harder to sin when you do that. I don't know why. I don't care why. I have a friend who's a substance addict. He's a chemical addict. And he asked, you know, endlessly, why, why did you become an addict? And he said, I don't know. I don't care. I just don't ever want to be one again. And I know how to stop being an addict. I learned how to stop being an addict. That's all I care about. So he doesn't spend one more hour of his life wondering how he got addicted to chemicals. It just does like what's his triggers and what makes me sin and what makes me bad and all that. none of that matters. Don't waste your time. That's the stream coming at you. That's the stream of screw tape. Think about that voice. Think about that John Cleese voice. It's deeply troubling. But make those disciplines your Lenten sacrifice. From this point on, I don't know, what do we have? Two, three weeks left? Is that right? Three weeks to Easter? Those are some good Lenten disciplines to undertake to start replacing your sins, your little small sins that are actually what's carrying you out of the orbit that intersects with God in Jesus and using the Holy Spirit to get out of the orbit that's carrying you away out into the darkness, which is what the book is about, to be alert. I'm going to try to, I, at least one person said they had a question. I don't know that I'll be able to answer it, but there are several people in the room who could if it's about screw tape. I'm hoping I can. Um, let's see. I think. One must face the fact that all the 
talk about his love for men and his service being perfect freedom is not, as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, but an appalling truth. He really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself, creatures whose life on its miniature scale will be qualitatively like his own, not because he has absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to his. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons. We want to suck in. He wants to give out. We are empty and would be filled. He is full and flows over. That's what it sounds like in my head when I read the book. That's who I hear. I don't, and I know I'm not crazy. I've talked about it with people in this room who you all know were not crazy, and they told me I wasn't crazy, but I did have to ask. So that's the seriousness of it. We're his food. And when Father Michael asked me to talk about this, and he asked me to give this talk, I said, okay, but you know I'm not like the person everybody thinks of when they need a hug. Right? That's not... Even, even wonderful little boys and girls, they're like, okay, I'll hug, I'll hug Mr. Jones. But, <laughs> but I am, but I care about all of you, and I love you all. And I would love you in the way that God loves you and Jesus loves you, which is to call you to alertness, the alertness that I have now. I fall a lot, I stumble a lot, but it, it is, the, the book, like I said, I, I beseech you, if you haven't done the book in about five years or more, Pick it up. The audible's really fast. It's great to do while you're walking. As I was getting ready for this, I did it. What I'm going to close with tonight, though, to keep us on time, uh, in one of my Lenin disciplines is that I've been, I've been reading the 51st Psalm every day, at least once. Um, and this is just a snippet from it, but I, I did some things with the fonts because I wanted you to see. Remember, my whole thing here for all of us is we're not going to go out and commit carnage. I don't need to go, yay, whoo, boy, I'm going to heaven because I didn't slaughter babies today. No, that's not true. But so here's a piece of it. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I ask each of you to pray with, just quietly with me. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Why? Why do I do this? Then I will teach transgressors your ways so that sinners will turn back to you away from the nothing. So now in a little tiny font, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed because we haven't shed blood. We're not going to now us. Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare, uh, declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice God, I pray to you and for all of us here, my sacrifice, our sacrifice, O oh God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you, God, will not despise. That's what God wants from us, and that's how we turn away from the nothing. So tonight, as you all go home, I beg each of you, I beseech you because I love you, please turn away from the nothing. Don't get wrapped up in the stream. We've got about three weeks left to Easter. Let your emotions take over. Be afraid and then, and then rejoice and have joy all the way through, not just on Easter Day. Have your emotions. Have your emotions on Holy Thursday. Have them on Good Friday. At the crucifixion, have your emotions and let them be used by God for his purpose. Thank you all.